Welcome to my live show. My name is Brett. This is my channel on the internet where I am every week on Thursdays. So if you're a regular here, then welcome back. If you're new to watching these videos, I do this. I record a live stream on YouTube every Thursday. We almost are always on Thursday, sometimes other days as well. And this week, I have zero guests. This is all about answering your questions on DevOps, Docker, Swarm, Kubernetes, anything containers, uh, anything running servers, getting your stuff out of your development environments into servers, CI, CD, all that stuff. So I've touched all those parts in my career. So usually I have a good idea of what's going on, but I don't always have all the answers. So throw, throw them at me. Basically, we're going to be here for an hour and I'm going to hear, I'm going to help students that are here actually going through the courses that I teach right now. Maybe some people are going to my workshop here in the fall in Berlin. And let me just tell you a little bit about that. Um, if I jump over here on my website, uh, brettfisher.com, I actually have a list of workshops and conferences that I do throughout the year. And in past years, uh, you know, a lot's going on. But this year, we decided to focus on virtual. So this year, I'm only going to be teaching orchestration and container stuff a few times this year. I did it at DockerCon at least three or four times, actually, during that week at DockerCon. And the next big conference for me is in Berlin in October. So if you're anywhere in the EU or if you're considering going to the GoTo conference in Berlin, I taught a workshop there last year in Chicago, and it was a great time. And I will be at the Berlin one for go to the, this will be my very first time there. And beyond just speaking, I'm doing a all day masterclass. So you might've seen that in the ad at the beginning. I'm doing an all day masterclass on learning the basics of Swarm and Kubernetes all in one day and helping compare and contrast them. So for a lot of you that are in the container world and you're choosing your orchestrators or you're having to decide which one to use for which project, that's what this whole day is going to be about. It's hundreds of slides of content. There's basically hands-on stuff all day. You will be using three servers and building out a swarm cluster, deploying distributed apps on it. And then we're going to basically take that same cluster, sort of tear it down, and then rebuild it as Kubernetes and build a three-node Kubernetes cluster and deploy that same app, that same set of apps, actually, across Kubernetes. And then you can experience some of the nuanced differences between the two and help understand some of the reasons why you might want to choose one over another. We'll talk about a lot of third-party stuff like storage add-ons, GUI add-ons, monitoring, logging, stuff like that. But the real meat and potatoes of that, and I think I'm the only one out there right now teaching this, is deciding whether or not your project is small and easy enough to fit into the Swarm scope because Swarm you know, Swarm has this many features and Kubernetes has this many features, but Kubernetes also has this much complexity and in, in management overhead. So Swarm uh, is very focused on a small set of features that are sort of the 80-20 rule, where it's 20% of the features that get you 80% of the way, right? 80% uh, of the, the time you could probably get away with Swarm. So that's what's going to happen in that day. We, we're going to basically deploy both, figure out maybe on your particular projects, which one you might use, or maybe you need both. I know people that are in production right now with both orchestrators. In fact, one strategy by a large um, insurance company is they deploy on Swarm first, and if then they need later the complexity or some feature of uh, Kubernetes that they don't get out of Swarm, right? Something uh, in Kubernetes that you can do, uh, some advanced green, uh, blue deploys, maybe it's some uh, higher end monitoring and um, health checks, because one of the things that Kubernetes has out of the box is two types of health checks, something like that, right? So they'll decide that and it'll uh, the day will help you get through that. So if you're interested in that, check it out on my website at Find Me. At the end of this and the beginning of this video, there is a coupon to get you 10% off, and I hope to see you there. There are already multiple students signed up from my courses that are take that are going to see uh, see me in, in go to. So I'm excited to hang out with y'all and, uh, you know, talk containers. All right. So, uh, let's get to some questions. I will be going back and forth between questions as we get them. And then I will, if there's no questions, then I'll just start talking about random Docker stuff. Um, 
Let's take a look. So uh, the first question here is, what are you launching a Kubernetes course? All right, so we are, the first thing I'm doing, okay, first thing is I don't announce course dates. Like basically the courses launch when they launch. <laughs> I don't have an expectation for when they're gonna be launched. But um, the first thing we're doing is a Docker Mastery Kubernetes 101 update. So if you're a student in Docker Mastery, uh, hopefully this month, no guarantees, um, we'll be shipping the sections, new brand new sections that are basically for someone who is doing Docker and doing Swarm. Uh, and you understand, you've basically taken the whole course, you understand all that stuff. How does Kubernetes run on top of that? So it's great for those that understand the basics of Docker and Swarm, because I will assume that you know that since you've taken the course. So the Kubernetes sections there will get you started with using, you know, the Kubernetes commands, how to get it running for, for your local dev and test, how to uh, deploy applications and what the differences are between Kubernetes and Swarm. And then at the end, it'll be about, you know, how to take YAML like you did with Compose and with Swarm and how do you use that in Kubernetes and how do you even use the exact same Compose file in Kubernetes, which is a really cool thing you can do with Docker. And that'll be an update. Then uh, later this year will be a full Kubernetes course that I am working on. I've been working on it for over a year now, actually, in the planning stages and building the content. And we will be announcing that probably, you know, just a couple of weeks before we launch it. But we don't really know how long it takes, right? Every one of these courses I build uh, has challenges and complexities. And we're, you're talking about a lot of these are 50 to 100 videos. So it's a team of people. There's five plus people that get involved with this stuff to help me out. And so it gets really hard to schedule uh, releases months ahead of time, right? So just keep hanging tight. Uh, thank you for asking. If you go to brettfisher.com slash newsletter, that is mentioned in the description of this video, that newsletter always announces all my courses and always ensures that you have the best coupons, um, as well as being a weekly newsletter on Docker and container topics. So check that out. That's the best way to get notified of the minute that I have big, big updates to my courses. So great question. Thanks for asking. And I've had a lot of people ask about the Kubernetes course. I know everyone's excited uh, to get started and you're probably already getting started, uh, but hopefully I can add some value there and, and teach you something you didn't know. Um, all right, so the next question up, since we're on the topics of Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes architecture, can you explain? Let me move that down there. So in general, um, Kubernetes, the architecture is very similar to that of Swarm. If you're familiar at all with my, any of my courses, you know that I talk a lot about Swarm. And Kubernetes architecture is very similar. You have, uh, in Kubernetes, you call them masters, uh, or sorry, man, uh, yeah, masters. In Swarm, they're called managers, but it's the same thing. And in a production cluster, you want at least three of those, maybe five. Um, Kubernetes, by default, will not run, it won't want to run your normal containers on those nodes, but of course, you can if you want to. Um, in Swarm, you're allowed to run anything you want on the managers, but you can always prevent that. So it generally in a larger cluster, since you have two tiers of servers, you have the masters or managers, and then you have the worker nodes, or in Kubernetes, they're just agents. They're, um, they're just regular nodes. And those nodes run a couple of containers um, that manage them. And basically, they sit on top of Docker, and it tells Docker what to do. So when you think of Kubernetes out of the box, uh, by default, it's mostly run on top of Docker. So it's really just a web API and a bunch of containers that run on a bunch of different servers that tell Docker what to do. And then once you've built that out, then you have to decide on what kind of networking you want. There's a bunch of different networking plugins. Um, and those will allow you to allow your containers to talk. And they have different levels of complexity. You know, there's everything from easy ones like Flannel that act a lot like Swarm to ones from Cisco that allow you to integrate your Kubernetes cluster with your Cisco networking products that you already have. So there's lots of options there. And then of course you have to consider things like storage, logging and all that stuff. But that stuff all rides on top of Kubernetes and then usually talks to the Kubernetes API. So when you think of Swarm and Kubernetes, they don't really differ much in kind. They just differ in level of effort and complexity. So each one of them is going to have two types of servers. 
the ones that control it and the ones that do most of your applications, run it, run your applications. And those all typically need to be in the same data center or in the same region. If you're dealing with something like AWS, you might have a couple of those servers on different availability zones, but they all need to be close together. And that's because all the or orchestrators today that I'm aware of, um, they all use the same backend database. They all use a similar concept known as Raft, and that's, a, that's an algorithm for how to do something called distributed consensus. And a distributed consensus means that a bunch of servers can constantly communicate and agree upon the state of something. And the state is the thing that is your cluster. So your cluster always is monitoring state and tracking changes that you're giving it and then executing those to result in your apps running, basically. So when you look at things like Swarm and Nomad and Kubernetes and you know, AWS's ECS and all those, they essentially all do the same thing. They have a distributed database. Most of the time it's running etcd, but not always. But those are always or usually running something that's the Raft algorithm that just determines state and agrees upon it across multiple servers. And then your job as the operator is just to tell those things, um, hey, I want you to execute this task, or I want you to execute this workload, or do you know deploy this many containers, that that kind of thing. And its job is to look at what you've asked it to do and look at what's currently running in the cluster, and then make those the same, essentially. So it's a differencing system that looks at your your commands and the stuff you're giving it, usually in YAML, and it just decides how to get that done the best way it knows how. And once you understand those basics, the nuances of the commands and the YAML formatting is, is just something you have to learn, right? Uh, once you realize that there's not a whole lot going on in the background other than these things constantly looking at your commands and saying, hey, uh, oh, you said run five containers. I'm going to keep checking to make sure five containers are running, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of the rest of it sort of falls into place. And they all, all the different orchestrators have different networking options, whether you want to run on you know just raw networking with real IPs on the network, whether you want to run want to run virtual networking and have virtual subnets, or you want some sort of higher level abstraction like an overlay network that makes it seamless um, and makes everything seem like it's on the same network together, even though they may not be. So that's it in a nutshell. Hopefully, I answered the question. <laughs> Um, if I had a drawing board, I would uh, draw it out. But essentially, you can imagine the smallest clusters in production you probably would want to run are something like six nodes, six, six servers, whether they're virtual or physical. And you might have three masters and three uh, agents, three nodes that are just running your work. And you don't have to do that. You can do it all on one you know, or two or whatever. But when you start to look at real fault tolerant systems, you look at needing three managers or masters uh, basically to, to ensure fault tolerance of the management control plane. And then you probably need three nodes or workers to make sure that your app is fault tolerant. Whatever apps you're running, you might want to run multiple copies of them. So three and three is, is a nice, easy way to get started. That's not the requirement. You can always start with one, but one server. But most people want to do it in a fault tolerant uh, way like that. So. Uh, great question. Next question. Is it possible to create a Docker machine in a virtual machine using VirtualBox? Yes. Um, it is just something you just create. A, you do it multiple ways. You can create a virtual machine and just install Docker. You install Docker using the official documentation from docs.docker.com. And you could do it that way. Or you could use a command line tool called Docker Machine. So check out Docker Machine. We can post the link in um, chat. And Docker Machine is something that will use VirtualBox by default, but really it'll work with just about any local vir virtual machine technology. And it'll create you a Linux machine and then automatically install Docker for you and then set up your command line. So that's a little bit easier, um, but there's no reason why you can't do it manually. Uh, it's all the documentation spelled out on Docker's website. And as long as you have a modern kernel on a modern Linux OS, so usually the latest versions of whatever Linux distribution you're talking about, uh, it'll work. So hope that helps. Pro tip there is to not use the default package manager on the OS. So don't just do apt-get install Docker because that'll usually get you an old version. You wanna go to 
Docker's website, look at their documentation, and follow the directions for your distro. Um, good question. Next question. Uh, not, a qu not a question, but a suggestion. It would be cool to add Docker app and context to your Docker courses. Yes, I agree. There's definitely a lot of new features this year. For those of you who were not here last week, uh, I did a three-part live show with a whole bunch of guests over three days, all detailing the new features of Docker 1903 that came out last week. So do check out those videos on this channel. There's uh, three of them. You actually can just go to the videos, you know, the little video link there, and it'll list them out at the top. And all of them say 1903 release party. So you can check those out and get all the cool new info. Um, and really what, what's happening with the courses is as things change more rapidly, instead of waiting for me to update my courses, you can just check out the YouTube updates. And so that's why I send out the newsletters with all the changes and the information going on in the, in the community. So definitely if you're taking a course, get on the newsletter because that's how I keep you more updated. Now, I also do that in the course with the course emails called the announcements. But the Udemy emails don't seem to get open very often. So I don't know if they're getting caught by spam, you know. So hopefully if you're on my newsletter, you, it won't be caught by your spam filter and uh, you'll get all those updates. Um, all right, next question. I'm considering your course on Docker, but I would like to know if the knowledge acquired is sufficient for passing the DCA certification. No. The DCA is about Docker's enterprise products. My courses focus on the open source tools. So what I recommend to students is, one, you have to know the open source tools before you even attempt to get a demo of the enterprise tools. So if you don't own a license of the enterprise tools, you can get a demo of it, but that demo is not very long. I think it's like a 30-day demo. So if you're going to take the DCA, which is focused on the enterprise tools, you first need to learn the open source tools. So my course is designed for that. In fact, my course um, is uh, what Docker employees take when they first get hired if they don't already know Docker. <laughs> so you take that course, that teaches you all the basics of all the open source tools from the Docker toolkit. And then once you're done with that, at the very bottom of the course, there is a long post on how you go about taking the DCA. And the DCA would mean you would need to know, go and get a, uh, you'd sign up for a Docker Enterprise evaluation license, and then you would download it and have to install that cluster of tools and then go through just the process of learning all the different features of it, and then go look at the DCA certification requirements, which I list in the course. So once you get through the course, which is you know over 10 hours of content in there, it's like 12 or 13 hours. So once you get through all of that, that gets you over 50% of the way there. And then the rest of it is about you learning the Docker enterprise functionality, which I don't know that there is a public course on that. Docker, Docker does teach that in their live trainings and at their conferences, but that's, many, that's thousands of dollars. I don't know that there is a course um, on the internet for you to take specifically that. There are other people like myself uh, that do teach Docker open source courses that say it helps you get ready for the DCA exam. But as far as I know, none of those actually teach the enterprise product. I will tell you, if you're planning on doing a DCA certification, you better get it quick before uh, they update it. So they're going to update it sometime this year, I was told. And it's going to include the Docker Enterprise 3.0, which was just released, as well as the new 1903 updates. So the current Docker certification is years old. So the nice thing is, is that um, all the documentation and information out there will help you get started. And there's no Kubernetes knowledge required for the current DCA certification. But they're updating that, which will mean that you're probably going to need some Kubernetes skills as well, which I think is going to mean it's going to be harder. Because before you didn't have to know Kubernetes, now you're going to have to know Docker, Swarm, and Kubernetes a little bit in order to take that test. So um, I would say if you're going to get it, get it fast. My course is the fastest way to get started. So do that. Um, and yeah, and the coupons are up there. <laughs> you, can get the, you can get a coupon for it for $10 and take it, get, ran, run through it as fast as you can because I don't know when they're going to update it. Now that the Docker Enterprise 3.0 is released, 
I'm assuming that the DCA update will come somewhere behind it. And then what we're all going to have to do is look at what the new certification update has in it, because it's going to be added stuff, what new um, requirements they have for it. And then we'll all have to adjust our training to, to do that. So yeah, hope that helps. All right, what's next? Um, let's see. Can you share your thoughts on observing people to using the Kubernetes offered in Docker Desktop and how well that's helped transitioning them to a server or service running it? Um, oh, and hey, Charlie. So uh, it's it's like every other Kubernetes. It's just not multi multi node. Um, so really, it's the it is the best way, I think, to play and learn Kubernetes locally. Um, it all depends on what your job is. If your job is a developer, then you shouldn't have to know how to build out a enterprise secure, the key there is secure, redundant, highly available, encrypted Kubernetes farm, right? A big Kubernetes cluster. That's more of an ops task, but uh, so I would say that, you know, none of these running Kubernetes locally is really going to teach you all that stuff, right? The only way, only way you're going to learn that is to either buy an enterprise tool like Docker Enterprise, which is what I would recommend, or Rancher, or use one of the cloud ones. And all of those, uh, you know, the cloud hosted ones are the easiest because you just click a button and then you can use the Docker local, you know, command line to talk to that remote engine, uh, that remote Kubernetes API. Or you get a product like Docker Enterprise or Rancher or OpenShift to manage and build your Kubernetes cluster for you. So those are all sort of ops tasks. But assuming you're not talking about that stuff, um, the, the Docker desktop Kubernetes is Kubernetes compliant, is uh, Kubernetes API compliant. It's certified. So that means that the experience you have with the Kubernetes command line, like Cube Control, is going to be the same using Docker desktop than it is using it on the servers. In fact, Docker is the only one that I know of where they they have the entire toolkit. So they design their local command lines to streamline the process of moving from dev to test to prod. And they're the only ones that do that. Almost all the other, vend every other vendor I know of, they're focused on giving you clusters of Kubernetes servers, right? But it's kind of up to you on what tools you want to use locally, right? Most of them will just use Docker Desktop. But Docker Desktop and the Docker Enterprise Suite, they now have that Docker Desktop Enterprise, which is even more designed to ease the transition from dev test prod, right? And if you saw the videos from last week in the release party, one of the neat new things Docker is doing is they allow you to do version packs, which means um, the version packs are going to give you the exact same command line tools and API tools locally that what your Docker enterprise tools are in production. And that's, you know, ideally, if you're someone who's really having to test down to that level, if you really have to get to specific Kubernetes versions and specific Docker versions, that's what you want. And um, there's even, when you start comparing local to remote, a lot of things might change. Uh, te technically, the Kubernetes API should just work regardless. But there's nuances between versions, there's, you know, there's changes, there's appreciations. If you change the underlying tool, like if you decide that you're going to run Kubernetes on top of Containerd or container, uh, Kubernetes on top of Docker, that might change some subtle little things with how your containers run. Um, it just kind of depends on what you're doing. But I think Docker has the most streamlined path if you buy their enterprise products. If you're just doing Docker Desktop, um, that is by far, I think, the number one way that people use Kubernetes locally on their machine. Um, most people I ask, and if I'm in a room of people, I ask to raise hands that uh, they're all using Docker Desktop Kubernetes because it's it's literally a checkbox. The nice thing is with the new release we just got, you can now run Kubernetes 1.14 locally. I think it's 1.14.3 or .4. Um, so that's great because the version up until a couple weeks ago was pretty dated. I think it was like 1.11, which was like a year old, I think. Um, so anyway, that's a great question. Um, but yeah, I think Docker Desktop is the best way to do it. Um, if you're an operator and you're trying to learn how to deploy clusters, 
well, then you're going to have to deploy some clusters and you probably need to do that on real servers and using real tools and stuff like that. Um, but if you're just going to do a cloud hosted thing, then yeah, I would totally use Docker desktop locally. Great question. Mm. Um, all right. So the uh, next question is, I'm trying to install Kubernetes as manual installation on three physical servers for our development team purposes from last one week. But our, no luck. Can you guide easy way to set up Kubernetes setup? Um, my recommendation is don't do that. Just give them a cloud hosted instance. So if your if your developers are wanting to use Kubernetes and you don't already have experience in Kubernetes and you don't have the four months to learn it and to be an expert in operating it, then I would not manually deploy it. Uh, um, I don't know any company that has less than three full time Kubernetes administrators that I would recommend rolling your own open source Kubernetes. Um, if, you, if you can't buy software, even because that's what I would recommend. If you're a business and you're making money and you're running things like Kubernetes, you should be buying products. You know, you should be buying support contracts or, or hiring experts that already know these tools. Because it takes a while. It takes a, it takes a good amount of time to learn how to operate on a true business production environment, these tools all on your own. That's why every cloud hoster is built, has built a Kubernetes service for you that's a, just a couple of clicks to, you know, get it deployed. And then all they have to have is just, if they wanted to administrate it, they just need the Kubernetes command line locally, and they just create a new context to talk to that remote server. So then you don't have to worry about it. But if you're building out your own cluster, the probably the easiest way, if you don't want to spend money and you just want a three node server, probably the easiest way to do it is Rancher. If you just go to Rancher's website and you download their Rancher toolkit for Kubernetes, Essentially, it gives you the GUI and the sort of the install scripts and the automation to set up that that set of servers, and that wouldn't require that requires you to spend no money, and it would ensure that you know you have RBAC properly installed so that your APIs aren't exposed without security, right? Because that's that's one of the risks, or that your databases aren't properly encrypted for passwords in the etcd database, or that you're at least a little bit fault tolerant by having three three master nodes, stuff like that. Right. Um, so do that. Rancher would be way, way easier than trying to do it just raw open source. There are d definitely other command line tools that you can use. I'm not saying that those won't work, but if you have been spending just a week on this, and so I, my guess is you're, you've only had Kubernetes, you've only been learning how to deploy Kubernetes for a week. I wouldn't suggest go using those tools yet. If your, if your developers are waiting on you, Rancher is probably the fast way to do that. In fact, next week, I'm going to have uh, a guest on the show who is one of the co-founders of uh, Rancher, the company. So Darren's going to be on the show. I'm excited to have him, and we will talk more about Rancher's products. So if you're interested in Rancher Kubernetes, definitely come back next week. Uh, you'll see that announcement coming out in my newsletter and other things here in the next couple of days. So yeah, it's going to be very cool. Um, He's got a lot of cool projects at the company with K3S and K3OS and other stuff. So um, let's see. Next question. What is the best way to implement SSL on a system with Nginx serving as a reverse proxy? Um, well, the best way, hmm, that is a very custom situation, right? Uh, I would have to ask you lots of questions. Are you using containers? Are you uh, are you housing um, anything in the Nginx other than SSL? Uh, you know, is it something on your servers that you completely control, or is it some hosted service? What I do is I use outsourced SSL. So I use something like I don't even use Nginx. I use Traffic, which automates getting my SSL for me. So traffic in a container is way way easier to get started as a reverse proxy than Nginx. Because Nginx, you've either got to get your own certificates and store them as secrets in your orchestrator, assuming you're using Docker, like Swarm or Kubernetes, and then get those into the container. Or you're going to need to add some other tools as containers to go get that Let's Encrypt Let's encrypt SSL t certificate and then get that connected into your Nginx. So um, I think, honestly, the easiest way is to not do that. <laughs> uh, I don't know any requirements, any of your project, but uh, traffic has the automation built in to get SSL for you. 
You can see examples of that over on my dog versus cat repo using with swarm. Um, if you looked in here, literally the way to put in a proxy on in front of any app um, is to just look at something like, uh, we'll just look at the easy one here. Something like this, where it's just a bunch of YAML to implement traffic. And then you have this stuff right here, which basically tells it to go get an SSL certificate automatically for your domain. So you can do something like that and that will save you the pain. Um, other than that, it would honestly, there's a, so many different ways to do it with Nginx. Um, obviously, if you went and bought your own certificate and you had your own files, I would store those someplace securely on the server and then you can just bind mount those into the container if you don't have an orchestrator. If you have an orchestrator, you should be using the certificates in the secrets and storing them there so that they're encrypted. So I know that's a lot, but uh, there's a, you know, Nginx is sort of a toolkit with, that doesn't really come with any of this stuff out of the box. You kind of have to create the configuration files and get the certificate yourself or get tools from uh, the Let's Encrypt like CertBot, which is a tool that you would use to get the certificates for you automatically. Some people can't do that. They have to buy their own certificates. Um, and that's also another thing. So hopefully that helps. Um, hey, all right. I am not able to understand DNS name resolution on Docker containers, which have the same name, round robin Docker DNS using network alias. So round robin simply means that for every new connection, the connection will go to a different container, right? So in DNS, we have this concept where if you add multiple A records, then that gives a bunch of different, you know, basically when you would do a DNS lookup, it would return all those IP addresses for the same name. And then the client, whatever your client is, whether it's a browser or some other, you know, programming framework that's connecting to your, um, connecting to your server, that is going to be doing the round robin for you. So uh, let me see if I can look up something. Um, first, you just need to look up DNS round robin because that's not a container thing, right? That's not a specific thing for containers. That's just uh, a technology. So you could probably find that on Wikipedia. And... Yeah, so you know, looking up what round robin is, what DNS is. And so when you're creating those two containers with a network alias, that's all you're really doing is you're just creating DNS records inside of the Docker engine so that when anything else on that network, on that Docker network, asks for that DNS name, it looks up and then returns two records. And then it's up to the client whether or not it moves the connection to a different one each time, right? So hopefully that helps. If you have more questions on that, uh, feel free to throw them in chat. All right, you're welcome, Charlie. Um, what Docker CLI plugins, oops, what Docker CLI plugins are available for Docker CE? Um, so in the, if you watch the Docker plugins video from last week, we, uh, which I think is day three, <clears throat> we also talk about plugins. Actually, I think we talk about plugins all three days. When you install Docker CE, there are only two out of the box I'm aware of. That is a build X and um, let's see, what's the other one? Um, build X and app. Yeah, build X and app. So Docker space app, Docker space build X. The way you know that on your command line is with the asterisk next to the command. So if you just type in Docker and hit enter, and then you see that uh, the list of management commands, the ones with asterisks next to them, and then they actually have version numbers. Um, those will be the ones that are that are CLI commands. So you can see here, I have a bunch. 
But the most of these are not free. They come with Docker Desktop Enterprise, which um, I have installed uh, from Docker. I, you know, I get it because I'm a captain. So I get some of these like assemble, um, cluster, registry, uh, template. I know Docker's working on some more. They, we saw some at DockerCon, like I think it's called Jump, uh, which they haven't released yet. But the ones out of the box are Build X for free and App for free. <clears throat> and we've had, we've had access to both of those. Um, the Build X is really just the, the new version of Build Kit. And so we've always had that for like the last year, uh, at least. And that's allowed us to just enable it with experimental and use the Build X. And then App is there. Now, if you don't see these, you have to make sure your command line is in experimental mode. So if you... Um, Mm, let's see, Docker uh, config. So if you do this, um, notice that I have experimental enabled. So that's different than my engine being unexperimental. This is just my command line being experimental. And some of these CLI plugins are still experimental. So now there's two places where you have to enable experimental if you want all the, of the new stuff, right? The engine gives you experimental features in the engine. Um, and then to see these extra CLI commands, if they're marked exper experimental, you would have to enable that there. Um, once you do that, there is, I believe, let's, let's do a Google real quick. I think um, on one of the shows last week, someone, someone listed, yeah, here we go. There's a, a list of them actually. So this is probably what you really want to know. So for the question of what CLI plugins are available for Docker CE, this is the only list that I know of. <laughs> of course, I haven't gone around scouring the internet, but um, one of the Docker captains has put together a list. I call it clip and there's some down here. So uh, these are all extras that are not included with your install. And what this tool does is it allows you to add and remove them. Because Docker, even though Docker has these uh, CLI plugins, they didn't, out of the box yet, create a way to you know, install them from the internet automatically. But this tool does. So you can check this out and add some of these, play around. Some of them are examples, like the, the example plugin. And some of the other ones, uh, like the show context, pretty pretty cool stuff to just make it easier. The, some of these are really just automating other commands you could already do, right? It just makes it a one-liner that's easier to do, like running the Aqua Microscanner on an image. You can already do that, but this allows you to do it with one line. So it's pretty cool. Because uh, normally you'd need like an API key and other stuff. So it makes that, that a little bit easier. Great question. Um... Docker Desktop with WSL2 on Windows is so much better. Native Linux integration along with Windows. I agree. Uh, the unfortunate part of that is that while we have a trial today, you can actually go to beta.docker.com, sign up for the, the sort of the tech preview, I think they're calling it. And then you have to be in the tech preview program with Windows. The, the, the only sad part about it is we're not even going to see the release of that until next year, <laughs> at least according to Windows, according to Microsoft. They're not going to release that uh, till next year. So most of us are not willing to run beta versions of our OS in order to get new Docker features. <laughs> but if you are, um, let me know how it goes. All right. Um, so yeah, hopefully I answered your question on the, the DNS round robin. So, all right. So that's it on questions. If you have more questions, throw them in chat. Um, if you don't, uh, let me see what I can talk about. So, I have a newsletter. I think you know this. So, brightfisher.com slash newsletter. And 
this week. So you can sign up for my newsletter at the at that newsletter URL. And this week talked about GitOps. And I it's actually a long newsletter this week. So I wanted to talk a little bit about it here and just give you sort of the basics of what GitOps is and what it is not. So we've all heard the term DevOps and that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It's a very, uh, it's becoming, I think, more vague in the industry to essentially talk about developers getting their code into production faster. <laughs> That's, it, it seems that every job that has the DevOps title in it or everyone who says they want to learn DevOps, their job is somewhere in that realm. You know, they may be a developer, they may be an operator, they may, may be someone who's focused exclusively on CI/CD. They may do lots of things. But DevOps is that nebulous middle piece between code on a laptop and code running in production on a server. Um, and GitOps is a style of doing that work where Git, the versioning protocol Git, is the way that you basically log changes. And so you think of it as the single source of truth for any changes to that process. That process being getting code off the laptop and getting it tested and then getting it in the servers and then updating it when it needs updated. All those things, right? And since we are, as a community of developers, already using Git so much, it's sort of become the default, uh, especially for open source programming, is the default way to store code for versioning. And there's more and more tools and better and better tools. Obviously, GitHub is a very popular one, but there's dozens, if not hundreds of tools out there that all use Git in some way. And it's, you know, it was created by the founder of Linux, and it was meant for managing the Linux kernel development environment, which was distributed, which means the team was all over the world. They weren't on the same network. They didn't work for the same company, and they needed to have an easy way to work on changing their stuff, essentially all their code, over time in various ways, and then to come together and manage all that, right? Manage, you know, the guarantees of being certain that certain people are only allowed to change certain things, being able to manage differences so that you know if two people change the same thing, how do we resolve that conflict, all that stuff, right? That's all a part of the Git workflow. And that some of you are probably used to today. You probably work in Git throughout your day. Maybe you're someone who has a general understanding of GitHub and you're not quite sure where GitHub starts and Git ends. And the Git command line is what we're really talking about here. But GitOps is about taking the DevOps patterns that you may already be using or are learning to use and using Git as much as possible. But most importantly, that Git becomes the way that you store all of your infrastructure changes. So that means your infrastructure has to be code. And what that means is that any changes you make need to be in something like YAML or TOML or JSON. And that if you're running, if you're doing something like manually editing files on servers and changing one at a time things on servers, that is not going to help you <laughs> in your DevOps um, world. And so GitOps is a way for us to manage and control all this change. And sort of the first step there is getting your servers and your CI CD and all the changes and automation that you're thinking about, getting that into GitOps rep or Git repos, whether that's on GitHub or Bitbucket or you know, Azure or AWS or you know, whatever you want to use, right? GitLab. Uh, there's tons and tons of tools out there. Uh, JFrog. Uh, there's just I could probably spout out another 20 of those tools. And they're all ways to store code in a Git repository or, or store anything really in a Git repository. And once you start storing your server configurations and your Docker files and your YAML for Kubernetes and Swarm, once you start storing all of that in Git repos, you start plugging all that together. And the next thing you want to do is automate it. So you want to automate your CI CD, or maybe you want to automate deployments to production, or you want to automate um, your updates to production, or you want to automate any changes to your servers so that you're never manually touching servers. Because if you manually touch a server, we call that a snowflake. A snowflake is 
something in your technology world that is different than everything else, and you may not know how it's different, and you don't want that, right? What we want is all of our infrastructure to be identical and to match our documentation. And nowadays, the documentation is usually in Git in the form of YAML, shell scripts, um, TOML, JSON, all those sorts of things. Sometimes you might put it in Python or Ruby if you have to automate things more. So you're, we're talking about Ansible, we're talking about Chef and Puppet, we're talking about Terraform. All those things tend to have uh, YAML. We're sort of all converging on YAML and a little bit of TOML. And those things are being stored in Git repos. But once you do that, you need to start looking at your infrastructure and looking at your workflows, getting that code from developers into production and saying, I don't want to make any changes to my cloud or my servers manually. I don't want to go logging into the server and do something manually. What I really want is to make changes in my Git repo and then those changes are automated and change the servers or the cloud configuration or whatever, right? Maybe it deploys the apps in Kubernetes. Maybe it updates the Docker images, all that stuff. And that is leading you towards GitOps. So if you check out this week's newsletter, um, if we haven't already posted the link, I'll put the link in the comments. But it's a mindset around taking your DevOps and focusing on the changes being implemented through Git commits. And if you think about it, if it was Utopia, if you had perfect Git ops, what you would do is you would say, what has changed today in my environments? And you would go to your Git commits, maybe you're storing them in GitHub. So you'd go to GitHub and a simplest little scenario would be a single Git ops repo. And you'd have all your Kubernetes YAML, you'd have all your server builds, you'd have any of your AWS cloud formations, they would all be in there. And then you would have automation somewhere else <clears throat> that would watch that repo for changes. And if certain files and certain directories changed, then those changes would be applied automatically for you. Once you start building up that automation, essentially your job is change management, is going in and changing some things in your Git repo, and then committing them with a really good, nice description in your, in your commit message. And that is the record which will you know, be forever in the chain of events over time. And then anyone who wants to go and say, hey, what's happened and what, you know, what apps have we deployed this week? What updates have we done to servers? What things have we changed? That would all be in your Git commits. Now, obviously you can't do all this in one day and it's a process, but I think this is the way that a lot of the tools are gonna to start to go. And you're gonna see tools out of companies like GitLab get more and more focused on the Git protocol as the way to store operational changes. And we call that GitOps. And it's only a couple years old, so read the newsletter, check it out. I provide a whole bunch of links there to get you started learning and understanding the basics of that. And um, yeah, you can, uh, in fact, I probably should make a short URL to get you to that newsletter uh, so that it's easier for you to get there. And once I do, I'll put that out in another newsletter. So thanks for listening to my little rant on that. I'm excited that uh, I, li I love Git as a protocol for sysadmin work. I've been doing that for a long time now. And finally, I think the community, we're coming together and have it. we have a word for it. So now that we have a word for it, it likely means that we're going to get people jumping on board and building tools to solve these problems and to make it easier for you to take the code that you're building and build servers and deploy to those servers using a very few amount of tools and using a GitOps pattern. So, all right, let me jump into the questions because I see that some of you have some. Um, all right, here's a good question. A little bit of a different topic. I have a Docker Compose file used by the rest of the developers, developers in my organization for local application development. I would want to develop a generic command which wraps Docker Compose commands. Um, I would not recommend that. I think that your desire to simplify it for your developers will only hurt them in the long run because if they don't know Docker Compose commands, you know, I look at Docker Compose as a tool for 
the workflow of anyone doing any development in Docker, whether you're operator, developer, build engineer, you know, DevOps person, whatever. All of us should be know, should know that command line. And I would argue that developers should know that command line more than the Docker or Kubernetes command line. Because Docker Compose was designed for local development workflow. If you start abstracting that away into other um, <clears throat> into other scripts, then one, and I've seen teams do this, and I don't know a team today that keeps, that does it for long. They tend to do it for a year or two, but the problem is their scripts get so fancy and only one or two people know those scripts. And so what happens is the rest of the team doesn't know Docker Compose. They only know the scripts. And so the scripts are their crutch that they use to get their environments spun, spun up. I think that if you'd use Docker Compose properly and you maybe create a couple of aliases that it is very, very easy to use in almost every, in every case I've seen it used, even with dozens of services, um, I don't see that it's a complex solution. And in fact, it's now being built into other tools like your IDEs. Docker has this new thing called um, Application Designer, which is built into their enterprise product now that's a GUI on your desktop that spins up Docker Compose in the background so you don't even have to type Docker Compose commands. But um, let me just tell you what I'm showing you what I'm talking about. And I think that most of the people that want to use Docker Compose and wrap a script around it, m most of my experience is, and I'm not saying that you're this person, but most of my experience is that they don't realize the full set of Docker Compose command line features. And so they're maybe doing things um, that there's an easier way to do it, Docker Compose, and they're um, maybe doing something that's a little bit harder than it needs to be. So for me, for example, I have the Docker Compose command line. But uh, in my shell, I have a set of aliases. Um, and these actually come out of the box with oh my ZSH, I believe. But you can make those for any operating system. So you maybe could make a script to give them these aliases. But this isn't really scripting, right? This is you simply shortening the command lines. So now if I go into, um, let's just do something. Uh, let me go into one of my courses and uh, I'm going to go into Sweet Compose. Let's see if that works. All right. So instead of me typing Docker Compose up, I can type DCUP, which is an alias, right? So I don't have as many keystrokes there. And I can just type that and it will download, you know, spin everything up, download the images. Obviously, it'll do the same thing because it's just an alias. And that's way less work with less typing. And it benefits your developers because they're going to be using Compose the rest, you know, until we come up with something better for managing containers locally. Um, it's one of the best tools out there. I think uh, without a doubt, if I'm in a room, um, oh, let me switch to my terminal. Um, so, sorry, let me back that up. I didn't realize I wasn't on terminal there. So if you look at these aliases, um, you know, D Docker Compose Up is just DCUP for me. Uh, Docker Compose Build is DCB. So I know that most of these commands start with DC, like DC down, oops, right, like that. And if I don't know what it is, I can just type DCO, which is my shortcut for just the Docker Compose command itself. And then I can do something like, if I didn't remember what the down one was, I could do something like that, right? Um, oops, and it's behind my little question there. So you, you can shorten the commands, but if you hide away the Docker Compose stuff, um, I think it's really only gonna hurt your developers and because they, they need to know this tool for not just this project, but for every other project. And if you start wrapping it with shell, what ends up happening is that for every new project and every new repo, you've got to now build more and more of these scripts because people don't know Docker Compose. So um, I think it's a universal tool. I actually, when I do classes, I have the developers do a couple of basic Docker commands to get started and understand the basics. But then I very quickly shift them to Docker Compose because the reality is all day long, we don't want to be running Docker commands. My goal for developers when I'm training them is that they'll never have to run a Docker command alone. They'll always be running Docker Compose commands, assuming they have the proper YAML. 
So they don't have to be an expert in the YAML. Maybe you just have one or two people in your team that set up all the YAML. But what I do for my teams is that I'll just record demos. I'll just make a quick screen capture of me using Docker Compose with that repo. And I'll spin things up. I'll spin things down. You know, sometimes people don't even know the basics of like Docker Compose up and how um, I could say something like Docker Compose up API, which only spins up a particular service and its dependencies. So if I have 30, you know, different services because I'm microservicing my stuff and I only want to spin up the stuff that's required for my API, I just do that. And maybe I put in a dash D so it runs in the background. Once I do that, then it will only spin up the containers necessary based on dependency, the dependence that depends on, if you remember that from your YAML, depends on is there for dependency relationships, not for startup order. That's a different thing. Um, and so this just makes sure that other things are started so that when this comes up, that it works, right? So yeah, there's stuff like that. And then down and, and build, uh, you can push. So if you need to push repos to an image registry, you can push from here so that you don't have to type in all the different things like the tag, the proper tags and all that stuff. So try that. Um, if it doesn't work, you know, come back another week and give me a very specific example of why it's, uh, it's you think you need to script around it. But I've seen teams do it and I've all, and every one of those teams I work with, we essentially back them out of that because it's too much work to manage all of their um, Docker Compose. All right. Let's see this. I think this is a question. Deploy commands are being ignored in Compose and depends on in Swarm, et cetera. Do you prefer a different YAML for local and prod? I think I want local environment as close as possible to production. Um, it is all based on the complexity of your project. Very few projects, uh, if you have a team of people, you're almost never going to be able to get a production YAML for Docker Compose that, and Swarm that looks identical to the one in your um, local development environment. It just, there's too many variances. And honestly, at the end of the day, it, if you get to a really truly production one where you're adding labels and uh, you're, you're doing health checks and you're setting up all the different environment variables. Um, so what I would do is uh, there's three features in Compose that help with all this. And there you can layer your Compose files. So essentially what I do for my local uh, for my local development, I always recommend the 2.4 or the 2.x versions of Docker Compose so that you can have depends on with health checks. If you need to know more about that in my node course, uh, that's brettfisher.com slash node, my node course, it is specific to node, but it goes through all the details of how to do depends on with health checks for local development. That That will make sure that your databases are ready before it ever starts any of your other containers. Uh, you don't need wait for it scripts. It actually is built in. And then for your production servers, you would use the 3.x versions of the compose files. Um, I think a lot of confusion is that two, that 3.x replaces 2.x and it doesn't. Those are two different version tracks on the Docker Compose. And the 2.x is designed for local development. The 3.x is designed for production. So I typically will try to create one base image, uh, sorry, YAML, and then uh, template that as much as I can. And then I have two other YAML files, one for dev and one for prod. Um, and let me get you, I think I have that. Yeah. So the, the article I'm talking about, um, and I actually go through this more in more detail in the node course. Um, is this O'Reilly uh, blog post? Let me just post that in here. So um, this one details three different things about how do you, there are different ways you can use environment variables and then uh, templating, which is a relatively new feature. I think it's like a year or two old. Um, it allows you to put parts of your YAML at the top of the file so that you don't have to keep repeating the same thing over and over throughout the files. And then um, using the, well, the scope is another thing where you can allow it to, you can uh, allow Docker Compose to, you can basically run it multiple times from the same repo and do different things. But the one that I'm specifically talking about, and I may, I'm not sure if I mention it here. 
is override. Um, so in that document, I list, I link to this override. So I would try that first. And basically, you're going to have a, a generic compose file that has all the basics. And then you would have other files. And when you do a stack deploy command or you do a Docker compose up, you can, there are certain conventions where if you name it correctly, like Docker compose override, uh, it will automatically use it locally as the override file. So for me, for larger teams, and this I've used this in up to 35 people in a team, um, is the Docker compose file itself is the generic local development environment. And then Docker Compose Override is what developers use to customize their own setup. Because every developer wants something a little bit different. They want different environment variables. They want slightly different configurations. They may not you know, care about certain things or whatever. They might have different paths based on their local development setup. And so you use the Docker Compose Override to override all that stuff. And that override file, then what you do is you put that in your git ignore so that it will never be put into code so that it never gets stored in the repo. And that way they can just have a copy locally. And then you might put a sample one in there like a docker compose.override.sample.yaml, right? Something like that, that would be in the repo for them to use and then make a copy of and do that. Um, I would say that for personal projects, I can sometimes get the same YAML to work for dev and prod, but um, I think it's really more about the fact that, that you can, you're using the same syntax and and not so much the exact same files for pr production and dev. It's it just all depends on the complexity of the project, the complexity and size of the team. So it's hard to give you a this works for everyone kind of situation. Um, but hopefully that helps. All right. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, someone with a tip. I don't know about DDev or Lando, but. Yeah, cool. Um, check those out. Um, can you suggest some best practices to do this with a sh without a shell script <clears throat> or make file? I would want to make a domain specific command like vapor up equals docker compose up. Uh, I still don't know why you wouldn't be using Docker Compose commands or just aliases like I, I showed. So um, I would give those a shot. Um, let's see. Is Docker secure to be deployed on prod instances as it's a very lightweight and doesn't have a complete OS? Can you please explain? Um, Docker is not an operating system. Um, and it is secure. I mean, millions of comp millions of people are using it. M you know, basically every I would say that ninety nine point nine percent of the top five hundred are using it somewhere. <laughs> top five hundred Inc. Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe you can can you ask your question a different way? Um, is it very lightweight and doesn't have a complete OS? Um, yeah, I mean, Docker can run on minimal OSs, so you can just take any Linux distribution that has the right kernels, essentially, and build on top of that. There's even such things as container OSs, though I don't really tend to recommend those. Um, they're just not as full-featured, and um, we don't really have a, a real popular one that's a winner yet. There's Rancher OS, there's Linux Kit, there's Clear Containers, there's other things like that, but um, it, it's something where you want to have expertise in Docker and in Linux before you go that route. Um, so... Is there any new about native Docker support for, uh, I'm assuming you mean FreeBSD. Um, no, I don't know any, anything about uh, Docker support in FreeBSD. I used to love FreeBSD 15, 20 years ago, but I haven't kept up with it. So um, as far as I know, there are variants that run on FreeBSD, but Docker doesn't officially support it. Um. All right, I think I'm all caught up on questions. Uh, unless you want to uh, re-ask that question about Docker Secure OS. Um, I think I'm all caught up, and we are out of time. So um, let's wrap it up. So again, my courses, uh, I have a new page for courses now. So you can go to brettfisher.com slash courses and get each one of my courses for $10. 
Um, later this year, or soon, we'll be releasing an update to Docker Mastery with the Kubernetes update and some refreshed content. And then uh, we will be releasing a Kubernetes course next. That's a full Kubernetes course. And I don't really have any dates on that. But as we get closer to that date, uh, near the end of the year, I will be giving you some more updates on that. And as, as always, stay on the newsletter if you want to get any updates on my content, uh, courses, any free stuff that I come up with, or any topics I want to talk about, like the GitHub or the, uh, the GitOps topic we had today. And I think that's it. So thanks so much for joining. I will be back here the same time next week. Uh, and I will have a special guest next week uh, from Rancher, the um, co-founder, Darren, will be on the show. And I'm, I'm excited to virtually meet him and talk about all their cool projects, including Rancher OS and um, Rancher Kubernetes and K3S and K3OS and all that stuff. So join us this time next week. And we'll be back here on YouTube Live. Thanks.